Good afternoon. Happy Sunday. This is a, I guess, living room chat about uh, one of the benefits of uh, home-centered church-supported study. As we've all been quarantined now for four months in our houses and left to our own devices to decide whether or not and to what degree we are intending to follow through with the prophet's declaration to engage in home-centered study, to show the Lord by virtue of the fact that we do it of our own volition without being commanded or forced to even attend services, what we are going to do with his day. I made some changes of late that I like in what I do with my free time at the end of the day. Uh, now that I'm back at work, I find that I return to the house from work and I have several hours at the end of the day that I don't really have any plans to fill because it's dark, it's warm in the summer here in Vegas, and I'm not really interested in the entertainment options available. So I turned to other things instead. A few weeks back, my father discovered in my, his father's footlocker that my grandfather had kept a physical, tangible copy of the October 1979 conference. And he told me he was reading through it, so I decided this week I would read through it too. I found it very interesting when I looked at it for many different reasons, uh, which I will discuss. Uh, first of all, I've discovered that there were many general authorities in 1979 to whom I'm at least partially related. Most people don't think about me as um, a mover and shaker in the church because I don't have a name that is recognizable in the faith. Number two... Um, the messages that were discussed then were very interesting. And number three, the admonitions that are given there reaffirm the need for a Savior and my particular individual reliance on him for his grace. So let's go through those uh, three different discoveries that I made this week in studying that uh, October conference uh, addresses. Number one, there are three general authorities to whom I'm related. They are Grand Richards, James Faust, and I'm going to forget that. Oh, yeah, Marvin J. Ashton. Uh, Marvin J. Ashton is of fame for his role in the founding of the University of Utah. The Grand Richards, I'm not sure if he's famous for anything, but James E. Faust was a member of the first presidency up until the time of his death uh, into my adulthood. Uh, shortly before I, let's see, the night uh, after I uh, checked into the MTC, the entire rest of my family ran into Elder Faust at the Lion House, I think, in Salt Lake City. Uh, Elder Faust uh, was a cousin. Uh, Elder Ashton is a, an uncle. And uh, LeGrand Richards is also a second cousin, all on my father's side of the family. Uh, our last name is none of those. And it's okay because I've also never met any uh, general authorities. I didn't actually know I was related to any of these men, uh, and I've never met any of them. I've never met any general authority, uh, but that doesn't dampen my testimony of, of the truth of their words, because truth resonates regardless of who the speaker is. I once uh, had my ex-wife tell me something that I've never heard said any better or any, with any greater degree of brevity that was uh, any less true. She said, don't be, feel bad, be better. <laughs> I don't know how to say that any better than she did, and I hate quoting her, but, you know, when truth is truth, it doesn't really matter who said it. That's, yeah, don't be sorry, be better. <laughs> don't feel bad, be better. Uh, yeah. Um, although I have received phone calls and letters uh, from individuals at various points in my life, the Times General Authorities have contacted me. It was always obliquely and, and coupled in vagaries. When I translated for Elder Cook, on his tour of my mission, I wasn't in his presence, and uh, he just took some time at the pulpit to thank me for my trying to keep up with the translation in real time. Uh, I tried to convince a companion to stay on his mission, and when he returned back to uh, Mannheim Ludwigshofen in Germany, I got a letter from Elder Uchtdorf addressed to Elder W's companion. That was me. <laughs> uh, I was also sent to visit Elder... Uh, I used to remember his name. There's another uh, member of the Quorum of the Twelve, Elder Worthland, Elder Worthland's missionary trainer. 
Uh, Elder Worthlin asked the mission president to send his very best missionaries, and I got a nice thank you note that was not personally addressed to me. Point number two. I discovered very much to my surprise that in October 1979, a lot of the messages mirror the same things we hear from the pulpit today, and some of them are at least as poignant. There is a talk in 1979 that basically says home-centered church supported. There's There are talks about Um, After much tribulation come the blessings, about refocusing on Jesus, about the importance of women in our lives, um, about the influence of of the philosophies of men mingled with Scripture. And and it's funny to me because there are people with whom you go to church who think that these are new topics, new revelation, oh, new changes. That means that just shows that the church isn't, you know, the gospel isn't forever. They're not new. They only feel new because these people have never heard it before because they're not studying things that were already said that they are not specifically and expressly asked to study. Nobody's ever asked me to go back and read conference addresses from 40 years ago. I did this of my own free will and choice, and it's not the first time going back and reading old things has uncovered things that have been said that no one knows they said. There was a reference uh, in a conference talk to J. Reuben Clark, who was a member of the First Presidency during World War II. I have a copy of my grandfather's Principles of the Gospel that was issued to him uh, when he went into the military. And in it, there's a quote from J. Reuben Clark at the time about dating. I was at an institute class once, and and I actually had the book with me by happenstance. I don't carry it around anymore. And someone said, well, we've never been told we should marry in our faith. And I said, we have. In 1942, J. Reuben Clark said, let Christians marry Christians, let Catholics marry Catholics, let Lutherans marry Lutherans, and actually did admonish us to marry within our faith. Not because those people aren't good, but because the more that you share in common ground, the easier it will be to weather the storms of life. Basically, it's not any different. It's just if your religion is important to you, then sharing one will give you an opportunity for shared strength in your marriage. I wondered when I made this correlation to the the themes that we're hearing from President Nelson in our day, if we've been wandering in Sinai for 40 years, never coming closer to the promised land, still getting the same things, the same manna, the same food, the same revelations, the same talks, because it certainly seems now, having made this connection, that God feels we might have been Number three, the talks reinforced the need for and focus on the Savior. As I read them, I felt the need to repent. I am no prophet, I am no paragon, and I need Jesus just as much as the next man. If you read my blog or watch other videos or know me in real life, you'll know that I'm a cynical, bitter, judgmental man who is sometimes short on faith. I am apt to criticize not just others. I also am very quick to find fault with myself. I shake my fist at the heavens sometimes and demand that God go bless someone else for a while when God sends blessings disguised as trials. And other times I shake my fist at the heavens and wonder why after exercising faith for many years I am not uh, reaping more what I sow. I have repeatedly, you now in every job I've had as an adult since I returned from my mission, been passed over for promotion, and then found out that the people who were selected were selected for facets I had, but they were not as good as mine. Um, and then there's a guy, Friday at work, I go in, I've been trying to exercise and eat well during this uh, quarantine period, and uh, he switches to the Atkins slash keto diet and lost 60 pounds in four months, and now looks like he's been you know, working out at the gym for four hours a day. And I look at that and think, really? Really? <laughs> Why can't I reap that? I'm working on it, but apparently I'm not working on it enough. So maybe I'm not somebody that you should listen to, but I do know to whom you ought to listen. I'm trying to be like and turn toward Jesus. Sometimes I'm wise. Sometimes I'm otherwise. Sometimes I help the Lord. Sometimes I distract people from him. Sometimes I make mistakes. Sometimes I actually actively rebel. Sometimes I manage only baby steps. Sometimes I make great strides. Honestly, I don't know if Jesus will decide to take away my sins. 
I hope he will, but I'm not sure that I would if I were he. They say that with what judgment we judge, we shall be judged. And so I'm trying not to be too hard on myself for my shortcomings, to judge my past self with present information. But I know what I was thinking then, what rationalization I spoon-fed myself, what I ignored, and I own the fact that I helped write my own story, that I decided the kind of person I've become. As a wise man once told me, you're the one who created the facts of this story. He also told me to try not to sound so guilty or evil when I speak, because he said, I've always wanted to defend an innocent man. So I've made a change in this study that I like. Rather than sitting here each night watching Star Trek reruns, I've started reading old conference talks. Rather than playing video games, about which I don't really care, or fritting away time on the internet, even if I'm learning good things on YouTube to give me skills or about history or the world or home improvement, the most important home improvement I can think I can do is improving how I spend the waning hours of each evening. So before bed this week, I started watching, reading these conferences, and it's made me think and ponder and question myself, reflect upon my actions and my activities, walk around and take breaks and think about what is the honest truth in my heart about each of these things. And I think that's a good start. I may not have a home, per se, and I may not be able to succeed here as President David O. McKay taught, but I want this place to be a place where if God gave me a family or if he came to share family home evening with me, I would have love at home and he would feel like I was a worthy executor of the responsibility of a father to teach, train, and give life. Sometimes I think God was wise not to give me a family. I am now so acutely aware of my shortcomings as a son of God, I don't think it's a good idea. However, I also feel like Jesus, who is a son of God, would not want me to say, speak evil of a son of God as he is. And I think he would want to help me improve. That's the whole purpose of these talks. The talks I have on my blog, the talks I have on my YouTube channel, the, the people who speak to us at church, if it's not bringing you closer to Christ, then it really matters very little what you are doing with your free time. Because no matter how many self-improvement books you read, self-help seminars you attend, no matter how many times you change your diet, no, no matter what supplements you buy, they're not going to change who you are by your nature. The only way to change who you are by your nature is to honestly think about who you are and think about what actually what you actually lack and how that can be affected for the things that we can affect then those are things we ought to change and for the things that we can't affect mistakes we've made in our past choices we've made that we can't take back people we've hurt lies we've told lives we've ruined including our own the only way to change that is with an eternal power, the power of Christ. I was talking with a co-worker this week who is, uh, I guess, re more religious than I expected. And I said to her, I talked with her about the fact that this is not the most important part of our existence. That no matter what you believe, even science tells us that when we die, we do not cease to exist. Now, the coil in which we're housed, we shuffle that off. And the form that we occupy may change. But who we are and what we have become does not simply dissipate into the vast ether of existence. It will change into another form. And maybe, just maybe, that's when the real work and the real value and the real worth will be evident. I know that talking about a living in the future is really only valuable when you are feeling optimistic about your future prospects. And it's difficult in a time like this to remain optimistic and to think about what will come. Also, because we don't know exactly what will come when we are dead. We've, ne you know, we've never been there before, never spent any real time there. It's difficult for us to comprehend that it might be any better. But 
Each day we wake up. We rise from our beds and we look at that as a chance to be the people we ought to be. So is death really an end or is it an awakening? Reading these conference talks has been an awakening for me. In your time in quarantine, have you been awakened? Have you been awakened to change your life? Whether it's starting the Atkins slash keto diet and losing 60 pounds. Gee, I wish that would work for me, but eating meat, cheese, and, and vegetables just doesn't sound like it would work for me. I'm Danish. Or if it's changing your who you are, not just how you look. Um, this is an opportunity for us to improve upon our time, to improve upon ourselves, to make positive changes in our lives, whether they are superficial or substantive, and to decide who we want to be this year, next year, and in the next world. Food for thought. What have you found that's been helpful or illuminating during the quarantine? Interested in your thoughts, your feelings, feedback, and your disposition. Improve when you can. Hold your ground when you get there. Godspeed and have a great Sunday.